Welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. And uh, what are we on, Josh? Are we like 310 episodes? Yes. 310. It's a lot. Five years. It's more than I thought we'd do. <laughs> it's way more than I thought we would do. Uh, People ask me, though, how long will you do it? And I go, as long as they'll let me. Yeah. Because what, and I was just talking to our guest, Peter, and we're going to introduce you to him in just a second. But people are like, I think it's so cool that you do the podcast. And I always tell them, you have no idea what it's doing for me. You know, I, I, I mean, I like the fact that people are being helped and listening and we've created a community through this, but really this is a crucial part to my recovery. It keeps me grounded. It keeps me in the mix and it gives me a, a purpose and a sense of giving back. Yeah. i I'm not in recovery, but I'll be honest with you. People ask me all the time, how do you sit and do therapy all week long? And it's because I get to do a few other things in my career. And one of them is this. I look forward to this every week. It's a, it's a good break from, you know, the clinic and uh, the other things that I do. And I love to come in and hear people's stories and hang out with you and Josh. And it's, I'll do it as long as we can. We've often said that the best podcast would be the conversation that happens when the mics are off. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun. Huh? You know, because we check in with Josh, we check in with you, we find out about your girlfriend, my girlfriend, the kids, and, yeah. and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, maybe one time we'll kind of do an uncensored uh, podcast. And just, Not on KSL, we won't. Well, how, <laughs> how about we do a kind of censored? Okay. Kind of censored. <laughs> that sounds good. Right here on KSL. I do think if we, we uh, yeah, well... Someday. But so here's the thing. I'm, I'm glad we brought this up because there's other podcasts out there. Mm. And, you know, when you're talking about comedy, there's uh, like a blue comedy and a clean comedy. Right. And they often say that the clean comedy is more accessible because everybody gets to listen to it. Well, and a lot of comedians, I've heard them talk when they're not doing comedy about that. That's harder to do clean comedy it's harder to make people laugh without shocking them but you've got people like nate bargetsky and, and some of those other ones uh that jim gaffigan yeah and, you know jerry seinfeld most of them are known as clean comics right and, and because everybody can enjoy it and so that's what we wanted to do and it wasn't just because we were working with ksl is that we wanted a podcast that's true that everybody could listen yeah. to and a lot of times even our guest just asked us he's like who listens to this podcast mm -hmm. and i go that's a great question i don't think there's a lot of people in active addiction that are tuning in weekly to see what we're up to. No, no, they're not tuning into a whole lot if they're in active addiction, right? <laughs> I think the people who are tuning in are people that are yeah. in recovery. We know that. And people who have loved ones that are either in active addiction or recovery. Yes. yes. Because we try to tell the whole story. We say it at the beginning of the podcast. It's a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, it's about recovery. And it's about all the aspects that go into uh, recovery. And there is a difference between uh, being sober and in recovery. And that well, is? Well, well, I would say the difference is, uh, you know, the quality of your lifestyle and what you're, if you're progressing or just holding on. So to me, somebody who's just sober is sort of white knuckling it through life, trying not to just being absent, use their DOC. Somebody who is in recovery has evolved their life to be finally what they wanted it to be. So they're healthy and, you know, mind, body and soul. So here's a good example. Uh, and we're going to talk to Peter in just a second because he's from Fit to Recover. But if you think about addiction, uh, kind of like a, a, a gym. So f hear me out on this. Okay. So you're getting ready to go on a cruise and you want to look good. So you want to go on a diet and that diet's going to work and it's going to get you fit and you're going to look good for the cruise. Okay. But you want to change your lifestyle. A diet will get you a good start, but right. it's got to be a lifestyle change. Right. And right. so that's the difference between, you know, being, temporary versus permanent. Yeah. And recovery is hopefully permanent. Right. And, you know, so sobriety is I'm just not using it right now. Recovery is I'm not using and I'm trying to make my life better. I think the people that come in who are in recovery and tell their story of recovery uh, are many of them say something like, I'm finally living the life I always wanted, you know, and I never thought it was going to be possible in active. Addiction. And you've said that a bunch of times. It's that crazy you, that even though you had in many ways a great life, it wasn't great because you were in addiction. And now you're finally living the full your life to the fullest, well, even I, though life had some great opportunities for you before. I know there's a lot of things that I say on this podcast, if you've been listening for the five years, uh, that I've repeated over and over again. And I just told Peter it when we first walked in. I go, I remember when I was in active addiction and uh, my ex-wife left 
and my mom was upset and the work wasn't going good and she sat me down and tried to you know do the motherly thing and, and a little tough love she's like casey this is this is bs but she didn't say bs I know. she goes you're out there partying having your a good- mom tells it like it is oh yeah oh yeah and then some <laughs> yeah but she's like hey this is bs casey you're out there living it up partying up uh having a good time and we're all paying the price which is the perception right people think you're partying having a good time when you're in addiction and you know we we're in a fight because i said robin does it look like i'm having fun you called her robin <laughs> yeah you don't do that you don't call your mom by her first name no that was no bueno right yeah she goes i am your mother and <laughs> and so but but that was yeah. the thing i was like i'm not having fun i'm just trying to get through the day i'm just trying to right. get to an even baseline so i can actually function and get through the day right absolutely and the perception is that everybody's out there having a good time but you've had so many guests sit there like hey i was i was sleeping in a gutter yeah i was using a sock to for the bathroom yeah. you know i mean it's just like and you're like whoa yeah that doesn't yeah. seem fun at all no it's not it destroys your life and it, it reduces any genuine positivity that you have in your life right so i like to get a lot of my recovery wisdom through memes yes we know nothing changes if nothing changes <laughs> well that's can't my argue favorite. with that one that's my favorite i think there's a pattern here on the memes yeah you just repeat the, th- the thing you said yeah and then it sounds wise but it is yeah if you take it to it heart. is what it is but the meme i saw today <laughs> i like what you did there you just repeated uh uh-huh. i did uh so the meme i saw today they said if you knew me in my 20s you didn't really know me you just knew season one of me Season one. Oh, that's very, <laughs> but very I, in the now. But I started thinking and I was like, there's some truth to that. Yeah. Because, you yeah. know, life it, for me anyways, the way I look at it is it, it's not about the end destination. It's about the journey and, and how we grow and move and shape and, and, and change and adjust and all those other things. So there's a lot of people who knew season one of me in my 20s. Right. It almost got canceled. Yeah. Yeah. Multiple times. (laughs) I know. And so I'm back again, you know, and I don't know what season I'm on, but I thought it was interesting. We've been on different networks. We've had to renegotiate contracts. I've done that too. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things. I I wasn't even thinking about that. Can't believe the show's still going. I know, right? <laughs> Pretty soon I'm going to be in syndication. Yeah. And that's when the money comes. That's what it rolls in, baby. But, uh, yeah, so, but I, I think that's interesting <laughs> because I think who we were isn't who we are. I hope not, actually. I hope not. I hope that regardless of where we started, that life is always getting better, that we're evolving. Anybody who wants to read up on this from a psychological point of view can pull out Carl Rogers and read about becoming, and that was a concept that he talked about, which is exactly what you're talking about, that the healthiest, happiest people are people that are always in the process of becoming who they want to be, meaning you're evolving over time. So every decade of your life is going to look different and hopefully better. But a lot of people get stuck in the past and a lot of people get hung up on who they were and they can't get past it. And I'll be the first to tell you, uh, forgiveness in recovery is important, but forgiveness to yourself is one of the hardest concepts to Mm -hmm. give up. And so that's going to bring us into our guest because he's got... We talked about self-compassion last week. Yeah. Right? You've got to have it. You've got to have it. And it's tough. Peter's our guest, Peter Shipman. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So you've been sober how long? Uh, as of December 1st, it'll be nine months. Wow. Have you started to forgive yourself? Uh, I think so. Um, I've struggled with this concept for a long time, kind of the self-compassion piece that you hear in a lot of the rooms, a lot of, um, you know, I've heard it in, in therapy. I've been, uh, in and out of my, my, so, you know, sobriety and recovery journey for a little over a decade. And I've always struggled with the concept of, uh, addiction as a disease. Um, I, I I had the same thing. I remember when I got into recovery and they said, you know, this is a disease. And I was like, I thought that was just something we told people to keep doing what we're doing. Right. <laughs> I didn't know it was really a disease. And I, I think I saw a lot of people do that um, and kind of took it personally as that's just, that's a convenient crutch. That's a convenient shield you can use. And I looked at the self-compassion, self-forgiveness part as kind of the other side of that, which is... Um, I didn't want to overindulge in woe is me, um, and so I kind of I kind of stopped well short of forgiving myself, and, and and have done that for a long time, if that makes sense, because I felt like forgiving myself meant letting myself off the hook for behaviors um, that I might be ashamed of, but that necessarily aren't 
um, those are behaviors. They aren't necessarily core to who I am. They're co- core to, or they're a part of who I was at a t- uh, point well, in time. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly last week we referenced the research by a psychologist named Kristen Neff. And uh, her research actually shows that that's a misnomer, uh, that people think self-compassion means you're just letting yourself off the hook. So if I'm going to progress, I have to be hard on myself. But the research actually shows the exact opposite. The people that can delineate the difference between their behavior and who they are and have self-compassion, compassion and support for who they are as a person, they actually improve their behaviors over time. They become more productive in whatever their goals are. So you you can easily see how that translates to trying to be in a life of recovery because a lot of change is required. Yeah, and I think um, it was really important for me this last, um, I said I've been in and out of this for about 10 years, a little over 10 years. I didn't really try to get sober for me um, until this last year. I'd, I'd done the the mandatory 30 day stint as, uh, suggested by parents, friends, employer, whatever. And that's such a common law. thing, isn't it? Okay. Before we get too far into that, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to find out where the story of Peter begins and how your journey into recovery started and how it looks today. You're listening to project recovery right here on KSL. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist and one of my best friends. Thanks, buddy. And our guest today is Peter Shipman, uh, who's got about nine months of sobriety coming up in December. But where does the story of Peter begin? Um, I'll, I'll breeze through the beginning, but uh, I was born in North Carolina. Family moved to Denver when I was still really young. Um and then moved to Salt Lake when I was 11. So around, two, yeah, 2000, 1999. How uh, many brothers and sisters? Two younger brothers, uh, now two younger stepsisters and one older stepbrother. Um, blended all of them family. Are, yeah, blended and scattered all over the place. Mom and stepdad in Mexico, younger brother, youngest brother in New York, other brothers here, um, stepsister in the Netherlands, stepsister in Alaska, dad in Boise, stepmom in Boise. We're wow, all, you're not kidding. That all is over scattered the place. all over. Yeah. Any other siblings with addiction problems? No. Of the whole the whole bunch, I'm the yeah, the one and only. The lucky one. Yes, sir. I like to say I was the snowplow for my younger brother. <laughs> out of the way. Just yeah. breaking the barriers, yes, huh? Yes, sir. Yep. You know, and, and there's something to say about that because, you know, uh, people will ask me, he goes, well, are your kids going to drink? And I go, well, I don't know. I hope they'll learn from my mistakes, you know, and because I think there's two types of learning. There's one that I'll tell you and then you'll learn or you'll watch and you'll learn. And so hopefully the, the latter is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, though, that we we like to pretend that we can just learn from observing. It's called vicarious learning, and that's because that's typically the le- least painful. Mm-hmm. But there, a lot of our learning in life is behavioral. And, you know, um, even though your kids uh, know your story, they may have to wake up with a hangover once or twice to go, oh, yeah, this isn't for me. This is what dad but, was but talking about. No, hopefully but hopefully not. No, hopefully not. But you never know. So do you remember the first time you tried drugs or alcohol? Yeah. Um, I was, I mean, I was pretty lucky at part of that. Part of this goes to the self forgiveness part. I had a pretty idyllic childhood up until I'd say 11 or 12. Um, family was together, happy. I had everything I needed, access to education, food, and, you know, shelter, a- anything I wanted. Um, present parents, loving parents, loving family. And I got into it in a pretty, you know, textbook way drinking out of the parents' liquor cabinet with a couple buddies um, freshman year of high school. Um, now, f- kind of similar to my story, and it was more out of curiosity. We've had many people on the podcast who the first drank because they suffered from anxiety or other kind of ailments and, and, and whatever it may be. Uh, I'm pretty sure mine was mostly out of curiosity. Yeah, So, and that's an interesting point because I think mine is a little bit of both of those things. The beginning was absolutely out of curiosity. Uh, just want, you know, mom was gone. We we wanted to try it. Um, I think one of the three of us had drank before and kind of go to the other two in, not with much twisting of the arm. You know, we wanted to do it. But uh, I, I have been medicated on uh, different SSRIs since I was nine. Um, I had severe anxiety, insomnia, later diagnosed with OCD. Um, and I've been on those SSRIs my entire life. And I think that 
while I might have tried it out of curiosity, there was a flip that switched right away. Um, That's it. It went from curiosity to, I mean, first time I drank was with friends. Second time I drank was by myself. First time I smoked weed with, with was with buddies. Second time was by myself. And then mm-hmm. from then on, it was a... Tell me if this is your thing. experience. A lot of people who have just kind of come by their anxiety naturally, it's just sort of part of their biology. I call it kind of being tuned a little bit higher. They don't realize that until they have the experience of the opposite. So until you have that first drink or until you smoke weed or do something, take a pill where you're like, oh, you could feel like this. 100%. Like I don't have to feel tense all the time. So was that your experience? Absolutely. I mean, it worked. The The pills worked to get, you know, I was sleeping two, three hours a night. My parents tried everything under the sun, uh, short of medication. Medication finally worked and it worked. And then the drugs and alcohol recreationally worked. But for the same reason you're saying, like socially, just, just sitting with myself, um, every aspect of my life became easier. And I wanted, you know, a lot of people... I don't want to, you know, speak for the population at large, but a lot of my friends anyway, um, worked their way up to partying, you know, and mine didn't feel like partying. I, I did party. It was a social part of my, you know, my drinking and drugging, but it was also very much self medicative And I went from trying weed to being high all the time, you know, for the next 10 years. Wake well, up. you've got that addict mentali- mentality, which is the all or nothing. Yep. You know what I mean? There's, uh, people I'll go, how come you don't drink? And I go, because I don't have an off button. If I get it in me, then we're off to the races. I Like I would sit down with somebody who would have two beers and walk away with a half a beer in a cup. I was like, w- what's wrong? W- are you crazy? Yeah. Why would you not finish that? I've thought about you before, Casey, when I've been out with friends and we'll be leaving a restaurant and you'll walk by a table and there are a bunch of half finished drinks and beers. And you've told the story about going back and finishing Oh, I forgot those. to tip. I got to go back and tip and I'll go back and finish their beer. I'm yeah. like, what? I'm not going to leave that. Right, right. You know, but that's that's the addict mentality. Yeah. But what Dr. Matt kind of described, and you even mentioned it, is that you felt the switch flip. And, 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 and I think that's what it is, is that mm-hmm. high tune going down to a little lower. Yeah. I mean, I think you're saying what people have said to me in therapy, which is like, I didn't know I could feel that way. Yeah. Like I didn't realize I was sort of vibrating all the time. My, my anxiety was so high. In fact, um, a mom joined a session with a teenager with me the other day and um, we were talking about his anxiety. He said, well, I don't think I have anxiety. And so I asked him a few more questions and finally his mom broke in and she just said, you vibrate in the morning. Like you get up and you can't sit still and you're all over the place and you have sort of a, a vibrating thing. And he's like, well, yeah. And she said, sweetheart, that's anxiety. Like, yep. like you, you don't have to feel that way. And it helped him kind of rethink, oh, yeah, th- this isn't how my brothers feel. This isn't how my friends feel. Well, because we only know what we know. Right. And, right. you know, in, in no other way until you try that drug or that alcohol like Peter did. And, and he was like, wow, this is must how other people feel. But you said that it escalated pretty quick. You went from smoking weed with friends to smoking weed by yourself to smoking weed all the time. Yeah. Well, I think to that point about realizing I can function at a little different frequency is I just didn't want to do anything uh, without it anymore. So it wasn't this case of like, I'm going to check out and tune out and I'm going to disregard all my responsibilities because I'm choosing drugs and alcohol over them. It's I'm going to keep living my life. I'm going to play sports. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to work, but I'm going to do it at this frequency because it's more comfortable. So it was just, yeah, I was under the assumption that like, well, this is just going to be here. It was very private. It was very much, I, I didn't wear it like a badge. I'm sure I did at times in high school, you know, at the parties, but Going out, going about my day being intoxicated was very much something that I like to hide and just know like this is my secret bullet. I'm gonna always have this with me, and that was that started young for me. Um, and it went up, yeah. Weed, mushrooms, psychedelics, you know, ecstasy, that stuff in high school. Um, and then it escalated, you know, got into the pain pills, and then the rest, heroin, crack. Okay, well, it. I, I want to take some time with it. So, uh, high school, pretty good high school career. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I was a varsity athlete, an honor student, um, took what I did very, you know, not seriously, but like I cared about, uh, my friends, uh, my reputation, you know, and again, that goes into, I think, hiding the drug and alcohol use, but I, yeah, I had a good, I had a good high school experience and my, my parents split when I was a junior dad moved out. Mom was pretty 
um, inconsolable. It didn't, wasn't around as much um, because she was dealing with her own Mm -hmm. traumas. And what that opened the door to was lack of supervision. So what was starting as kind of this anxiety self turned into I freedom do whatever I want all the time. Yeah. What was that like for you personally to have your parents divorce at that age? Um you know, I think I was a a stubborn um I was 16 and I just was pushing back at my parents cuz that's what six, a lot of 16 year olds do. And sure. so I part of me I think just relished the freedom. Um I don't think I really and this goes back to your initial question about self-compassion. I had a really hard time accepting that I had trauma because I would go to therapy and meetings and all these things. And it's all about a lot of it is about people sharing about their trauma and how they dealt with it. And I just was sitting here saying I've never been sexually or physically abused. I was not in a severe accident of any sort. I don't have trauma Um, and I still struggle with calling a a split household trauma. Um, But whatever you want to label it, it it changed things there's no doubt that once that happened things escalated quickly um and i just don't think i was processing at the time i was just happy to have no supervision well well, i I appreciate that you are a little uncomfortable with the word trauma just because currently that is kind of the vernacular of our day where people are overusing the word trauma and therefore diluting its meaning in a person's life what i would say if we could describe what you went through without the word trauma we would say a 16-year-old, even though they do, when we call that middle adolescence, they, they often push back on any authority, including their parents. But your your family life creates a sense of security and groundedness for you that you don't understand or appreciate at that age. And when parents divorce, it inevitably diminishes and can even remove completely that sense of security. And so um, whether we want to call that traumatic or not, it's certainly this acute stress that's happening that you're not equipped to deal with at that age. And so kids at that age will often turn to um, things that end up that are powerful, but end up being self-destructive to try to recreate a sense of groundedness. So sex and drugs, those are kind of the two big things that a lot of adolescents turn to. And of course those are powerful and in the moment, like might be a relief from the, the trauma that you're feeling, but uh, long term, they have major consequences. And so that combined with a lack of supervision, which is usually what also happens when parents divorce, yep. at least temporarily, um, that's a tough spot to be in. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's it's worth considering if, if you're uncomfortable or any of our listeners with the word trauma for stuff like that then don't say it's not traumatic. Just say, well, how was it for me? It was hard for me. It was a life-changing event. It was. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think there was, like, to go off what you mentioned, um, just that destabilization, I I idolized my parents um, and really just, and, and for good reason, you know, they were good parents. They were good, you know, they worked hard. They're um, active members of the community. And I just kind of, I idolized them. And so when I watched them, because of course they're going through their own stuff, I saw very different versions of them and they're kind of like a veneer crumble a little bit. You saw behind the curtain. Yeah. And they were the one telling me not to do drugs and not to drink and all this stuff. And here I am. It just kind of flipped everything on its head. Like, well, maybe what they say doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't it, hold you know, as much as I thought it did. Exactly. So I kind of because if took, they've got it all together, then they wouldn't be in the situation that they're in. Yep. And I looked at that. I took that worldview and ran with it. This kind of like moral relative is like like all the things I was told were right, wrong, good, bad, might not be. Question everything. Yep. Right? How about you mentioned at, before the step siblings came into the picture? You were the oldest. Yeah. And so, in a situation like that, you have two younger brothers. Did you? feel or did your parents actually put responsibility on you to sort of take care of them in any way? Um, so it was an ugly and still is an ugly acrimonious split. Um, Mm -hmm. and there was a lot of triangulation going and I, um, I don't want to disclose too much, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, kind of cut and dry. Now we have two families. It was ugly for a long time and I was definitely the linchpin between a lot of it and still, still am and both my brothers now are adults and have gotten dragged into that um mm-hmm. 
but it's still they can't really my parents don't really can't really coexist um mm. that makes it hard yeah and i do feel that's one of the areas where like i feel like i can forgive myself for a lot of the the stupid um dangerous impulsive stuff i did while using but not being there for my brothers when they were you know i guess one grade school the other kind of middle school and then into high school um I was kind of tuned out. I was not kind. I was definitely tuned out and I was not. And that's, those are formative years for them. And I still struggle. And I think we're repairing because then, it, then it went on for a decade where I was just using and gone and out of the house. Absent. Yep. Um, but even while I was still there, I definitely, yeah, I regret um, not being able to be like a, a big brother, you and know, role model, big brother. that's spoken just like an oldest child, right? Cause you oldest kids, even when parents are fully functional, tend to feel a sense of responsibility for the younger siblings. And especially when you used a great word, destabilization of the family occurs, that they feel that. So I can see how that's probably something you'll continue to, to work on. And that's the power of self-compassion uh, is being able to deal with something like that and not just stuff it down, realizing like I had, you know, I have to re revisit that with hopefully a professional and, and work through like, how do I feel about myself? I was a kid dealing with stuff, what well, you know, but I also felt this responsibility. Now I feel guilt for not being there for them in every way, but could I really have been? And yep. how, it, you know, what am I expecting too much of myself in retrospect? So it's a lot to, to, to deal with. And I, my only advice to someone in your position is take your time. There's no rush. Yeah. yeah. And those are hard things for addicts to do. Yeah. <laughs> Be patient. Um, but yeah. yeah, I'm, that's the only thing that's worked so far is little bits at a time with them. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So where does it go from after high school? Uh, so I left, I graduated high school in 2010 and I went to college in California. Um, Southern California, small school. I played baseball there um, and left with a pretty severe uh, cocaine addiction and, um, my early, my first two years of, of high school, my parents were still very much involved in, I was doing all the ACT and SAT prep and um, AP classes and all this. And we were visiting schools and I was, you know, um, mm -hmm. again, incredibly fortunate to be sent on that trajectory. Last two years were a little different. My grades dropped. I was using um, and there just wasn't the time or, and they did their best, but there wasn't the same kind of like attention to detail yeah, or, yeah, and desire on my own part to really like go better myself after high school. I kind of sputtered out and was like, I just got to get out of this state. This was the one school that offered me a baseball scholarship and I had never heard of it before. And it was tiny. And I was like, well, it's in California and it'll get me out of Utah. And my little cohort of friends at that time, we were all doing a lot of Coke, started doing pain pills. Um, so I went to college in California and when I came back for that first summer, um, all three of them of what I would consider, well, there were five of us really, all four of them were addicted to heroin. The, the, you know, Rio Grande area was up and running and I kind of came back and, you know, having left been like, yeah, we were partying way too hard. I'm glad I got out, came back and was like, wow, this is very much mm. a changed ball game. Um, shortly thereafter, I went I went back to college uh, for second semester, and while during that second semester, one of one of the five of us overdosed and died. Mm. Um, I came back that next, you know, in between freshman and sophomore year, reached out to one, and I was not being a, uh, uh, you know, a, I was still still getting high at college. I was just. I didn't have a dealer out there. I didn't know where to go look for it. I was a little insulated, so it was just back to kind of smoking weed and and a little more mellow. Yeah. Um, definitely still using it like an addict, but like things are a little less volatile when you're, for me, when I'm a pothead than when I'm running and gunning with the other stuff. Uh -huh. And so I came back and kind of, they were a mess and I was um, not, and I definitely had a sense of like, I made it out and they didn't, you know? A glimpse of what your future would have been like had you stayed? Yeah. And I think instead of heeding that as a warning, I took it as a, as a, a sign of I'm, more capable um which was i can not handle the case. it they yeah. can't handle it i can I'm handle different. it i'm different which really i was just fortunate to to be out there it had nothing to do with with willpower or willpower. any of that other stuff yeah so i came back and i reached out to one of those um well each summer i'd come back and i'd 
get I didn't really get a hold of them because they were they were at pretty tuned out. But I had another buddy who was doing and selling pain pills and I got really into the oxys. And so every time I'd come back my summer, I'd work, I'd install sprinklers and do Oxycontin all, you know, all the paychecks would go to that. And I was, that was the first time where I started noticing, like, this isn't that like anxiety, uh, reducer so I can go about my business. This is my business is going to, uh, you supply went from my drugs. wanting it to needing it. Yep. And I stopped going out. I didn't, I didn't want to socialize, you know, um, things started to change and yeah, so I, I, I kind of, I think that's where the thorns kind of first got to me was while I was at college and I was still lucky enough to get to go back to college, um, out there. And I, I did well, I was the editor of the school newspaper. Um, I, you know, I graduated, uh, with the degree at, you know, honors degree in English literature. I played baseball for two of those four years. I didn't, um, didn't finish it out, but ostensibly I was fine. I was still holding up enough to everyone around me to be like, I'm, well, I'm I mean, what addict. you just described is better than most. I mean, as far as achievement at a young age. But that's an addict. I mean, that's, you know, we're checking the right boxes. Yep. Because th these ones make you think that I'm okay. And those gave me all these convenient shields to say, look at, and, and especially Doesn't my an friends. graduate with this? Does right. an addict do this? No. And like you said, you could, if anybody questioned you, you could say, well, look at all my buddies that yep. I, I went to high school with. And it, exactly. And it came, I came back um, after... I graduated in 2014 and was like, all right, I'm going to take the, the, what is it? The GRE GRE. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to grad school somewhere else. I was back here living with, we signed a year lease with some, some of buddies that weren't, in, you know, involved in, in, in that type of lifestyle. Um, and waited tables and skied and reached out to one of those old friends and was like, Hey, can you get me some Coke? Sure, go pick him up. He takes me downtown, buys crack. At that point, I was not, I was enough into it. I was like, sure, I'll try, you know, whatever. Um, tried it and. Well, you probably had this false sense I can of handle I it. can handle yeah, it, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yep. And I was working an internship at a marketing place and took the GRE, did very well and got accepted into a grad program at NYU and was all set to go. And in the like six or seven months from when I got that acceptance letter until the day I was supposed to leave, my addiction just started. I was down at the the shelter, you know, the Rio Grande area every day and all day and every night, back and forth, back and forth. I was mm. showing up to my internship, either critically hung over, strung out or, or loaded. Managed to get through that and still get like we were glad you did your internship with us. Call us if you're, when you're done Letter with your of recommendation. Huh? Yeah. Wow. And the night before I was supposed to fly to New York, which was ridiculous because I had no money. It was all going to drugs. I was telling my parents, I'll figure it out. I'm going to go stay with my grandma out there and then I'll find a place. I wouldn't have lasted a week out there, you know, cost alone, let alone drug addiction. And I go down and I get arrested the night before I'm supposed to leave down the Rio Grande. And um, that was the start of what, that's what I consider the start of like my recovery journey in the sense that, again, I don't think I really tried. I, I know I didn't try till much later, but at least now it was like, I could tell my family, like I'm doing, it's bad, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you don't have to tell them the mugshot will do it for right, you. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I was, that's one of those things that we're like, well, now it's out. Yep. You know, there's no hiding this. And it was a huge, I mean, it was the scariest time of my life. I, I think more out of reaction than wanting to to die. I don't suffer with suicidal ideation. I don't think depression is really part of my, my bag. But I was like, you know, I went and got my dad's gun. I was going to kill myself. I was, now that they know this, all of the stuff that I was holding up to justify. Your house of cards gone. came tumbling down. Yep. Um, and that was the start of just a decade of but that's cycle. what the disease does because now you've been you've been fooling everybody for so many months and, and doing all this stuff you've been you've been getting by you've been passing the intern you've been graduating you've been playing all this and then you do this right mm -hmm. so now an addict brain well at least this is where mine would be like well everybody knows so let's rock and roll you know what I mean? And that's, I mean, that's what a lot of addicts do. It's like, well. Might as well. Yeah. I mean, wh what am I hiding now? Right. Yeah. And I think, so 
I've had those moments. Those would come later. I think for me at this point, I was still so hung up. I can't exp- like the biggest thing for my story, I think is this like, it was a facade really, but this expectations, I'm still going to be this, this. Well, let's, let's pause for a second. Like we're talking about a guy, you, who is off to a master's program at NYU. I don't know if everyone listening knows how hard that is to get into. Like you can be brilliant and still they have what, 30, 40% acceptance rate. Like, I mean that you were off to do big things, things that most people would struggle to be able to do when they're sober. And that deludes your, your self perception yep. makes you feel like, well, of course I'll just be able to keep going. Look what I'm doing. But it was obviously, you know, a train that was headed off the track. Like it was going to crash. Yeah. And I want to give, um, it's funny. Cause yeah, that it was, it's ego. It's just, it's yeah. This sense that I'm different, that I'm better, that I can. And, and again, these friends, my closest buddies were still struggling. One of them got sober pretty much right away. And he's now like 11 or 12 years sober. The other two were in and out of rehab jail, you know, doing the thing. And I still had this sense of entitlement of better than of different. Um, I'm not like you guys. Exactly. And I want to give credit to those. They're all sober now and doing well. Um, That's good. And here I am the one who was headed to NYU. I'm figure I'm nine months clean now, 12 years later, or, you know, 10 years later. Um, I thought I was different then. I was just prolonging the inevitable and not allowing myself to be humbled you know how much did you stick out out down at the rio grande here's this oh yeah honor student college athlete heading off to grad school in new york i bet you, you like this people, did anybody think you're a narc, narc? Oh, oh, yeah. all the time yeah so there was aside from just like the worst narc of all time i got ripped off six, so many three, times pounds, narc. Yep. Yeah. yep and i got i got ripped off and what was i gonna do about it i'm the least intimidating guy you know down, <laughs> um i and then i realized quickly i got to keep a little change of i'd keep a hoodie and a beanie and some sweats in my car so that i could so get off kinda, work change into those it was ridiculous yeah. yeah were you scared going down there the first time um but it's I think you'd have to have an addiction to go hang hang out down there. Yeah, and then it became the place that I I just longed for all the, and it's it's wild that still to this day, like the cravings or the urges or the the fantasy about using when it occurs is not usually about getting high. It's about like disappearing into a part of the world that I'm not a part of um have been fortunate enough and blessed enough to be like kind of insulated from and so there was a thrill it was it was scary and then it pretty quickly turned into a like i love that like danger I, yeah no one knows i'm down here no one would like i get to kind of disappear and then i get to go get high in my car do and, you ever drive by there and get any sort of feelings these days i work right by it. well um not so much. I mean, I work very close to when, uh, you know, the ballpark area, which is another area I ended up later in my addiction um, a lot. Um, and I think it's been a blessing to work down there, actually, because it's it's kind of rechanneling my association with the area. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is just time and patience. Like at first it was really difficult. I remember my first week at work, I was, yeah, like this is going to be hard. And it's it's amazing how just yeah. Being there and not getting high enough times. It's exposure therapy. Yeah. yeah. So you you don't go to NYU. Yeah. Uh, you get arrested the night before. Yep. Where does your journey take you from there? Um, so I went to, to uni for detox, went to... Uh, I know somebody else that went to uni I went for uni. detox. Yeah. yeah, seven days. Roomies, yeah. Um, so I went... Yeah, I think, did you say seven days? Yeah. yeah, I think me too. And then I did their outpatient program, relapsed during that outpatient program. Is that program. the recovery works program that they used to do? Um, I think it is. Probably. Yeah. It was that when I was there. It yeah. was a great, and it was a good program. Yeah. I just wasn't, I woefully underestimated. I kind of got, left the arrest, was like, cool. I'll, now everyone knows there's a little pressure off my back. I can kind of recalibrate here. So why did you go to uni? Did Was it an option presented to you or was it a choice? No, at this point, parents, I mean- Drag, dragged me there um, and I was I was a mess I had just gotten arrested for the first first time um, I had you know 
threatened to kill myself went and got a gun realized pretty quickly i wasn't i wasn't but it was i was a mess and no one had i had never seen myself like this no one had so i was just like hands up there's definitely still a huge sense of like i'm caught i'll do whatever um to save save yeah. face here there was no even seed in hindsight of like i need to do this for me um or i'm gonna die eventually it was a like i'll do whatever you guys say um and that led to back so the uni outpatient relapsed um like just before finishing that and then waited tables for a while when it got real bad went to rehab in like 2017 or so got out relapsed like the first or second day i was out used for a while it turned into iv use during that stint went back mm -hmm. to rehab um got out and used the the second i got out um and then i never really had a it was back to where it was after college at the beginning i'm like okay i'm gonna figure this out um and i went i applied and got into grad school at the university of utah i said i'm gonna stay here it's actually affordable i'm gonna do this but i the, the i had, was still i'd go a couple days sober this is another thing my period my pattern of use was um somehow for the first six, seven years, maybe even more, I'd go on three, four day benders. I'd clean up for three or four days, three, four day benders. It was just like clockwork. So I was able in those like interim clean parts to like get some stuff done, uh, go to work, pay my bills just enough, you know, and I, and apply to grad school. And that was in 2018. Um, and I went and, and I ended up graduating. I took one semester off because of my my addiction got, it was bad the whole time, but I started missing, you know, couldn't hold it together for a semester, but, but graduated a four semester program in five semesters, um, was a TA teaching one of the undergrad writing courses. Um, but I remember shooting up in the bathroom and going to class. Um, I remember it, I got on probation. I, I had a couple possession arrests in that period while I was in grad school. And I remember so I just became a severe alcoholic because I was being drug tested and I was able to just Kinda switch shifting. it up. Yeah. yeah. And I lived right by a 7-Eleven on camp near campus and I'd stop, get three tall boys on the way to, to teach class, slam one immediately, slam one in the bathroom at on campus, and then slam one when I finished class. Um, graduated, presented my thesis. Again, was just living this. But when I was not at class, I mean, I was... I was not socializing with anyone. I was not, I was waiting tables to pay, um, you know, pay my rent and stuff, but tall boys I, are expensive. Yeah. Um, I had credit with the Seven Eleven next to where I lived. <laughs> the guy who worked there. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, he was just, he, he was, he felt bad for me and I, he, I, I must've spent thousands of dollars at that Seven Eleven. He'd give me a six pack if I didn't have money to pay, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was brutal. I, I get told a lot when I, share bits of my story. It's always the same answer. You were functioning addict. You're a functioning alcoholic. Um, and I have much like the, tr the trauma thing. I have a lot of mixed feelings about that term. Cause like functioning to what degree, uh, I, that's what we say on the podcast. Exactly. Yeah. I was getting certain things done, but I had, I had invested a lot of time and energy into being a good student and like putting on a good professional face and like doing that. And I could, I was, I could lie through my teeth and manipulate my way around and, and had enough competency to like do these things. But the rest of my life was in shambles. I was taking money out of anyone's wallet that was around me. I was not there for anybody, any of my family members, any, um, anybody at this time I started living with a, a girlfriend. We ended up getting engaged. I was, again, there would be stints, brief periods where I'd get sober for a little bit, a month at most things would be okay, but I wasn't there for her. I wasn't functioning. I was just like surviving. Yeah. And part of surviving for me had always been bring home a good report card, um, whatever that looks like. And that turned into, you know, a grad school and then work. Like as long as you are doing those things, as long as you can pay your bills and get good grades, like it's everything else is okay. And so I think I just learned how to do that stuff high and drunk. Um, but I couldn't do anything else. And yeah. So after you graduate college, where do you go? Uh, so 
graduate school. He's, he's beyond college now. <laughs> um, oh, I get it, Brainiac. And <laughs> this is the Brainiac we're looking at right over here. NYU. I, Where'd you go? And, Kansas? Yeah. I like Kansas. Jayhawks? <laughs> Shockers. Nice. Oh, Wichita. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah so I, uh, I finished grad school and applied immediately to um, – teaching jobs. Uh, and I, it was during the pandemic and the job, you know, you remember the education stuff and the upheaval that, I mean, it was just a wild time to be applying to be a teacher and got, uh, a middle school teaching job. Um, and I had managed to like, kind of taper things again, still very much a drug addict and alcoholic, but it was kind of back to that, um, few days on few days off I could drink but after the second or third time drinking it ended up with the coke and it ended up like it, it just would always but I like kept the balls rolling a, a, enough um to I get noticed this it's, job. it's a little uncomfortable you to talk about this yeah I just um why do you think it is there's a lot of I mean a because I was just deceiving everyone um and b because there's a mix of pride over the fact that I did, I, I still did go to school. I still did get this job. And I, when I was a teacher, um, again, the functioning thing, I could have been a much, much, much better teacher. Um, and there were periods of sobriety during my first couple, uh, years as a teacher, some significant ones, you know, um, good chunks of the school year. And I don't, I mean, I was entrusted with people's children. And so there's just a lot of guilt and shame over the fact that I wasn't taking care of myself and I wasn't bringing drugs or alcohol into the school. I wasn't exposing the kids to that kind of, they, and I don't want to say for sure, but I, I doubt they were any the wiser. Um, we were wearing masks. It was easy to hide kind of mm -hmm. a hungover face. Um, so I don't want to like dismiss how reckless and, and, just horrible that is. Um, but also want to still, I, I do take pride in the fact that like, I love that job and worked really hard and did. I mean, I still, yeah, I have, I have parents um, of kids who know all about my stuff now. And I've been open with who I'm still in contact with and, and say their kids love having me as a teacher. And I, and I have a box full of letters of kids who, who appreciated me as a teacher and I know I made an impact on their lives. So it's this really weird combination of like, I regret so much that I, I could be that reckless. And then also like I, I take pride in what I did there and the impact I made. Well, I appreciate that you're willing to <clears throat> be that honest and share that. Uh, it's a real dichotomy within yourself, isn't it? On the one hand, you really, um, were probably, I hope proud of yourself for your educational achievements and and proud of yourself for working hard and wanting to bring a good experience you you don't get boxes of letters unless you did that so you made an impact that there's evidence of that uh parents who are willing to say that they still appreciated you even after learning about your addiction on the other hand uh this is a guy here casey who's obviously becoming even more uh, grounded and self-aware because you realize that you're you feel guilty and ashamed for not bringing your a game you 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 still made an impact but you could have done so much more and i like the fact that you recognize you were entrusted with their children and i wish more teachers i, I think most of them probably do but that's such a special um profession because you are there's a huge amount of trust when we send our kids off to school that not just that they'll learn but that they'll be safe and and, and well regarded by their teachers. And so I can tell that you're struggling still with some of that and another argument for working on some self-compassion because I, what came to my mind when you were talking about that is he was doing the best that he could because you were behind the eight ball with that addiction and you still wanted to show up for those kids. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate you um, pointing that out. I think, I think one of the, I would always say when people would ask me about teaching and, and I, I kind of feel like, and as anyone who's been a student, which most of us have been a student at some point, um, know like there, there, some teachers are better than others. And I would always say like, there's kind of two types of good teachers that I see now that like once I was working in the field and they're the ones who are just, they're just 
machines. They can build a curriculum. They've done all of the pedagogical, um, edu- they know how to teach. They know how to run a classroom. They know how to do it. They're technicians, you know, mm-hmm. and they, and the kids respect them because of that. You can probably picture those teachers where it's like, you might not have liked that teacher, but you're like, that was a good teacher, you yeah. know? Yeah. And then there are the teachers who are, uh, come to your level and treat you like a human and listen to you and care about, you connection. know, connection. And I, I, I definitely was not the the prior. Um, I, I wasn't building excellent curriculums, um, or running a super, you know, when I first started teaching in middle school, I had no idea about classroom management. My degrees were in English. They weren't in teaching. And I kind of thought I could go in and talk about books and share my, my knowledge and we'd be good. And it was mostly about keeping them corralled. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And so I had to rely heavily on the, the second one, which is connect with the kids, treat them, you know, eighth grade is like a, it's a hard time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. People are mean to each other. You're self-conscious. You know, we all know. It's one and of the hardest times of life, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And 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 so realizing like mostly what these kids want is A, to be cool, and you know, and, yep. and B, to, to just like not be treated like a little kid because it's the first time you're like a little independent. You're, you're not quite a little kid anymore. Right. Yeah. And I think I did that. Um, and understood that and was a good teacher because I would connect with them. Um, and also because I was a bad kid and I, even though I was a good student, I got in trouble all the time. You know, I was, I was a pain in the butt and then was a bad kid as an adult, you know? And I think there was a, a part of me that was like able to even, I couldn't say, Hey kids, I've been arrested. You know, you talking during class isn't, you know, I, you're yeah. not going to get this one by me. I, did, I obviously couldn't be that explicit, but I think I could could communicate to them in some ways. Like, well, you could relate to them, I think, and and that's not something that they or you at the time might have really been able to verbalize. Yeah, but it is an emotional connection. Like they probably felt like, hey, this guy gets me just on some level. Yeah, and I tried to, I tried to meet him where they were at. Exactly, and that was you. You did a bad thing. You're not a bad kid. You know, and right. this was. This was a, a Catholic school where rules are, and I went to a Catholic high school. Um, mm. Rules are, that's just part of, you know, <laughs> uniform, all just, yes. yeah. um, and and I was not, uh, there were kids who were just so tired of getting put in detention because uh, of the infraction. And, and I understand the reason for these rules and how they function in, in these schools, but I was able to communicate like, look, you're not a bad kid because kid you didn't tuck your shirt in. Um, here's why you got to start tucking your shirt in. It's going to save you a lot of headache in the long run, but like, you're not a bad kid or whatever. Um, so yeah, anyway, I was teaching, was teach. I taught there for three years. So how did it end? What does, uh, Peter's rock bottom look like? Yeah. So this happened during, um, so my fiance, we were living together and she pandemic's kind of ending. Um, I'm working this job and I, I start getting, I, 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 like I said, for the previous, like the first year, year and a half of teaching there, I had maintained it to this where I was just kind of drinking. I was doing it a, a few days a week. When I do, I would drink to being, you know, passing Backup. out. Yeah. yeah. But I was like, we could still go do, we can go on dates. We were still had, we had a, a relationship, certainly not the, the one it could have been, but had one. And one of those times, like I said, it always ends up, I, I went and, and found drugs and, and quickly and got a dealer and stuff just got worse. Escalated like at, it does. Like it does. And she gave me chance after chance. And eventually one day I was just, it was bad. And she's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go find somewhere else to stay. And at that point, much like when I was a kid, I was just like happy to have the apartment to myself and not have to sneak it around her anymore, mm. you know? Um, but then she was she had been gone for about a month and what went from those few days at a time, I'd, I'd schedule it around when she had to go do something when I'd have it, the house alone and, you know, just lying, manipulating, now no supervision, again. no supervision again. Yeah. And I was, this was the first time in my life I was using all day, every day and I wasn't sleeping at night. I was, and this was, so this was the first time it really started impacting my work, impacting everything. I started having ask for help for rent, you know, from family, um, it was like I was waking up, going to the dealers, you know, running um, immediately after work and then up all night using. And then, you know, I 
I'd crash for a day. Eventually, the body's got to sleep, and I'd, I'd show up late to work, you know, sleep through alarms. I had an overdose in that interim where fentanyl overdose had to be Narcan back. Didn't tell any, again, not telling anybody. Didn't tell anyone I overdosed. Didn't tell anyone I was, but my fiance was, was out of the house, um, but it was spiraling quickly. And at this point, my dad comes down uh, from Boise because he's worried about me. He kind of, guards my door for um for four or five days i'm locked in the room he talks to my i I talked to my boss she was wonderful she knew about my issues before she hired me she didn't know the extent but um i opened up with her over over time and she worked with me she would give me a couple days off when i needed them um we wrote up a you know kind of probationary contract for my employment there. She did everything she could to keep me. Um, and finally it was the spring of like 2021, I guess. And I had to go to treatment. It was just so bad. I was using every day. I was a a complete mess. Um, and she allowed me to go for the last month of school, um, go get help. And they got a long-term sub for that month. And they, my class sent a, uh, they just thought I was sick, the kids, you know, but sent a big letter. My boss sent flowers. Like I was getting all of the support. And this is something I want to like, again, with the trauma thing I and the self-forgiveness, like I had all the support. I am, I'm a one in a million in terms of like the support network I've had and the second chances I've been given and all of that. Um, so it kind of crashed into me landing in treatment works now on the line, you know, would have been done if I had, if not for the grace of the people I worked for, Um, and then that's the first time I got, so I tried to get sober. I, I kind of say, this is the first time I tried to do it. I stayed for like 50 days inpatient, got a sponsor, uh, an old friend. And he was a manager of mine at the restaurant, called him while I was in, in, in there was like, you know, I'm going to try that. I want to do this because I had known he was in, uh, recovery for a long time when I worked for him. And he's like, finally, I just glad you didn't die. I was been waiting for you to call me for years, you know? Um, agreed to be my sponsor, visited me every Sunday in treatment. So I started working a program finally, um, and got out of treatment. Um, my job went to sober living for the summer until school started, um, went back to teaching, uh, that next fall, um, four months clean. Um, and I should have shouted him out earlier, especially since I, I now work there, but, Fit to recover is in, entwined in this whole thing. Um, so I was never willing to start AA or get a sponsor or any of that. I didn't do any of that. But I got introduced to Fit to Recover in 2016, uh, referred there by a, a pro- probation officer, um, and met Ian that first time I went. Ended up getting taken there when I was in treatment. And that was always the place I went back. So I didn't have a program I was working, but I knew Ian, and I would call Ian he, for some reason, he was the only, I just hadn't experienced a place like that where like I came from this place of like, I can't tell anyone what I'm doing. I got to hide. I got to, and that was like the first time I'd been in a place that wasn't an AA room or like a, where I was like, oh, this is safe, but it's also like a community. It's not just. And there's no shame or judgment, right? Yeah. And that's a very different experience. And I felt that. And so I would always just call Ian. So like throughout this story I've been telling, Every few months I check in with Ian, I'd get all gung ho. I'd go to fit to recover for a few months and then I would drop off the face of the earth. And then I'd call Ian a year later and be like, come on back, you know, and that would, and that's gone on, um, and continued to. And so finally, when I, this, I, I went to treatment and I got about four months clean going back to teaching. Well, a big part of that four months was, um, fit to recover. I was there every day. Um, I started taking part in their, their creative arts program, their music nights. I, I was a musician uh, in college and, and since. Oh, and, sure you were. I mean, you, yeah. <laughs> NYU, athlete, you forgot to mention musician. Well, that's how I work, <laughs> where I work now. Yeah. And and so I'd go to their music nights and I uh, would be at workouts every day. And um, I was working with a sponsor and I was doing, and it was finally like, I actually, this is the first time I was like, I'm going to be sober the rest of my life. Like, I actually want to do this. I'm not 
going to just try to drink or just smoke weed or just do this to appease someone. I'm going to like, I'm going to die if I don't. You're, you're, you were no longer negotiating your sobriety. Exactly. And that's what a lot of addicts it's do. It's a they, different you know. switch that flips. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you're like, well, if I can do this, then maybe I can do this. But if I do this, maybe this and whatever. And, it, yep. and, and they negotiate it. And it, yeah. it's until you that you're right, Matt, that, that flip switch. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. And I think, I mean, um, I scared once, once I had the apartment alone and started using every day, it was like, Oh, I, I, this is me too. I think it took me almost a, or a decade to admit that I'm an addict and, and, um, I'd been an addict all along. I just, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, like it took me a little longer to get to that point where I, the realization. Yeah. And I, and I guess maybe a, a lot of other people would have gotten there earlier, even having lived my same story. I just, I was stubborn and egotistical and, and I guess vain and whatever else I was, I'm different and I'm. Well, our experiences shape our perceptions of the world and ourself. And from a very young age, your experience was, and you know, I don't want to embarrass you, but honestly, you, you have a, uh, high intelligence and you have a high capacity for learning and, and performing and wanting to succeed. So we've talked about, you know, college level sports, music, and then uh, a lot of academics. And even if a person were studying something that's not like, you know, the most difficult thing to understand, if you haven't been to graduate school, like, like it's the, the fact that you could do all that, write a thesis, present it, and be as uh, addicted as you were was actually training your mind to believe something that wasn't true, which is I'm invincible. I'm okay. I can do anything I want to do. I look at all these achievements that I have in not just one narrow area of life, but many areas of life. And so it, while it was destroying your, your self-perception and belief about yourself in the world, and on one hand, it was building up this false sense of uh, invincibility on the other. And so ultimately we look back on that, we might say, well, I was cocky or arrogant or whatever, but it's like, I don't know. That was your experience at that time. Your brain was logging that I can do all this until eventually the realization catches up with you that you really can't. So did you yeah. end up losing the job as yep. a teacher? So so what happened is I went to I went back to teaching. So I had this bubble after treatment um, where I was it was the summer. I was getting paychecks cuz I was a teacher. We had the summer off, but it was a 12 month month pay schedule. So I was in sober living. All I had to do was go to outpatient, go to yoga, go to fit to recover, go to therapy, um and I could still pay because I was getting my paychecks. I could afford to just do self-care for a whole summer. So I was like, well, this is easy, you know, and I'm working with the sponsor and I'm gung ho. But like that was such a bubble um, because then school starts back up again. And it's um, it's a demanding job in the sense that it's just you're there early in the morning. I mean, it's not the most demanding job and the schedule is very forgiving. Like I just said with the, the summers, but like it can be really taxing enough um, when you're on in school, especially with the pandemic stuff to where I just stopped going to meetings. I was going to bed real early. I wasn't going to fit to recover. And it's just a story you hear a million times is once you stop your program, whatever mm -hmm. that is for you, AA fit to recover something spiritual, whatever it looks like people will succeed in a lot of ways. Once you stop doing that and recovery becomes second, third on the priority list, which it did for me. I was like, this job is what's important. Um, it was only a matter of time. So December, I was about eight months sober and I, yeah, I relapsed. I just gave, I gave in one day. I was obsessing and ruminating and I'd been, my cravings throughout the whole time were getting bad because I stopped doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. I was just going to work and then white knuckling at home and it was tough. So yeah, I uh, relapsed and then that December to... This past, the end of February was just a run that made the first one look, I mean, it was a story you always hear in the rooms too. Like it's progressive. It's a progressive um, disease. disease. And when you pick up, it's going to pick up where it left off and it's going to amplify. And that's what happened to me. And I had, like I said, it was kind of the first time I was like trying to get sober doing a program. So I think there was a part of me. I know there was a part of me because when I decided to, to use, I was like, 
everything was good. And I was like, well, I've never been even close to eight months sober. And I was able to use on and off for so long. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not a real addict all the, (laughs) so I'm just going to go really hard this weekend. I'll clean my act up and go back to work and that'll be it. I'll get it out of my system. Well, of course, five seconds into that experiment. Mm-hmm. So what is so? Do you hit another rock bottom? Or yeah. You... So I end up getting a DUI in December, um, and then I end up just missing. You know, showing up late, um, having to call in for subs, just like not doing my job. You know, that's when it, it started getting bad. Um, boss, kind of discuss. I, you know, I get to a point where I'm, I lose. I can't pay my rent in my apartment. Got to move into my mom's house. Um, I'm just, I'm out of money. I'm sick. I'm physically, you know, I'm the, the, I I was able to like quit on graceful, you know, again, I had this, you know, this wonderful person of a boss who made it as seamless for me as possible. Um, but was, but they had to let you go. Yeah. hundred percent. And they should have. Um, and yeah. And so then I'm just alone in my apartment in psychosis. Um, no job, no money left. And I'm no sleep, just not eating, you know, bodies falling apart. All the, all of the attendant stuff that happens to a, someone with using that much Coke opiates and alcohol, I'm just falling to pieces. Um, getting a car wreck on a suspended license. Um, I mean, I just burnt it to the ground right after I, once I stopped having work, it was already burning to the ground, but, um, fully just you threw gasoline on it. Yep. So I'm, yeah. Um, so multiple DUIs. Yeah, multiple DUIs. Ian um, Ian calls me because I was going to Fit to Recover so frequently leading up to that relapse. Um, Ian calls me to take me to lunch and picks me up, uh, or I meet him at a kebab spot, and I am I haven't eaten in a couple days. You know, I look like a zombie, and we get lunch, and Ian just. Um, he's just, he buys me lunch and is like, you know, he's not, he's not going to offer me a job, but this is what obviously I, I needed, I was a mess, but he, he kind of sat and, and he just talked to me like me and I was able to be honest to him with him about everything that was going on. And he wasn't shocked or judgmental or he was just talking to me like a normal person was like, well, you know, um, we're always here for you. And sounds like teaching probably isn't in the cards for you right now uh, or should be. And, um, we don't have any jobs open, but you've been a part of this, you know, and you've been a friend of mine for a long time. If, and when you're ever, ever able to get your act together, give me a call. And, um, and I would, you know, we'll find something. You can work the front desk. And so I went to treatment shortly thereafter, like a few days, um, did 60 days inpatient, did the outpatient program. And at about five months sobriety, the creative arts program, um, the head of the program left and Ian, uh, called me. Cause I, at this point I was bugging him and Vicky every, you know, every few days. Hey, if there's, I'll come, uh, you guys need a janitor. You guys need someone to sit at the front desk. Like I was humbled at this point and I was like, so yeah, relieved. I mean, devastated, but also like relieved. There's nothing left for me to even try to hold up. And it was, uh, it was like, now I don't have to do anything. Fitz recovers a place that saved my life and does a lot of good. I'll, I'll go work at the front desk there or, or do something menial because like, I was still in a sense like my life's kind of over and I was as freeing, honestly. Yeah. Um, during that run, I was just kind of like t- counting down the day, like, well, this is going to end with me going to prison or I'm going to kill myself. Or like, this isn't, you don't think about like post this, this bender. Like it's just, so, so Ian yeah. saved you. Ian saved me in a lot well, of ways. Really, and a lot of other yourself. people, a lot of other people saved me too. But well, what's great about Ian and folks that do that kind of work is, it isn't their first rodeo, so they're never shocked by what you tell them. And they provide opportunity. They provide solid opportunity and support. And thank goodness for people like that and programs like that out there. Um, But I like what Casey said, which is you finally were, I guess, humbled enough and in a mindset enough 
to be able to say, I'm really going to, instead of running with my addiction, I'm going to run with these opportunities that are being handed to me. My name, Dr. Matt, I mean, his story is wild. I mean, um, I saw some similarities from my story and his story, mm-hmm. uh, being able to check certain boxes and gain a certain amount of success uh, and still maintain an active addiction. Uh, but it, it is, it, it's it's true. I mean, it's, it's a facade. We throw all our eggs in that one basket and the rest of our life is just falling apart. What... Uh what look? What does the future look like for you? Do you think? Um, well, I hope it's. Uh, I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, at the risk of sounding like a, like a cliche, like I just I'm not thinking about it for the first time ever. Um, mm-hmm. Well, and this this nine months and I, almost nine months is so much not easier. Just like it's not. I'm not fighting cravings. I'm not white knuckling it at home. I mean, last night. And it's this job. It's the fact that I'm out of a world um, where I have to be one person and then go put a tie on and pretend to be another. And I'm in a world where every day I'm working with people that are might only be a couple days clean or um, I'm. But you can really be yourself, right? Yes, and, that's the key. And that's free. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just is. I don't have to put on any pretense and it's made it like the time's flying by. Um well, I appreciate yeah. the fact that you've been so honest. I think your story absolutely reflects the fact that addiction is no respecter of persons. doesn't matter how wealthy, educated, supported, where, what part of life you come from. If you are struggling with an addiction, it is a disease and it will, it will humble you, right? And uh, I get a sense from you that you feel um, happy. Like, yeah. like I, get, I can just be... Peter, and this is a place where I can do good and be myself. And um, man, that's something I hope we can all find. So thank you so much for thank coming on and sharing your your story today. I think this is going to resonate a lot with our listeners who um, maybe are toying with the idea that somehow we can beat this disease uh, through our you know hard out-think work it. or outthink, yeah, maneuver it. But we can't. You know, the thing about Peter's story uh, makes me go back to uh, Rob Eastman. And I remember Rob Eastman, when he first told his story, was that uh, he was a man of many masks. And he'd have a mask for this situation, a mask for that situation, a mask for this situation. And he was never sure who was underneath the mask. And nobody really... It's hard to keep track of after a while, right? You you know, and it sounds much like Peter's story. He had a mask on. He had this educational mask. He had this, you know, pioneer park mask, you know, all these other ones. And so for the longest time, Peter, I'm not sure you knew exactly who you were. Mm-mm. And it's tell you've been stripped of everything and you're down and you're looking out. That's who you look in the mirror and find out who I am. I do I have one more fight in me? Who do I want to be? Do I want to be happy? Do I want to give back? Who are my people? Who is my community? And it feels like that your safe space was always fit to recover. And you yep. go back there and you found most comfortable there, uh, least judged there. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a, a open, free space for you. And so I think you're finally figuring out who Peter is. And the good news is, is your history before that proves that you can do just about anything if you put your mind to it. So I think the world in front Definitely. of you now, Peter, is whatever you want it to be. And Take your time. I love yeah. the answer of yours. Like, I'm not worried about the future. Right. I'm and that just was a gonna, very authentic answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to see where this goes. Yeah. And I'm going to work on me and I'm going to figure out who I am and what I'm about and, and go from there. And that's okay. And that's, that's great, I think. So I think you should rock and roll, buddy. Well, well thank you guys so much. Uh, for those who have been listening, uh, Fit Recovery's got two locations. They got one in Salt Lake. They got one in Orem. They've got a nutritional program. They've got a, a music and creative program. They've got a physical program. I mean, they. I love they, referring people there. I mean, because I know it's going to be a good experience. Yeah, I don't know if I told you, but my first experience with Fit Recovery was when I was in recovery we'd go there on sundays and yep. and that's where i met ian and that's where i found out about him and so when i started my sobriety journal uh journey i've always kept in touch with ian and he's just a solid cat and what the work that they're doing is amazing yep i appreciate it guys yep well thank you for stopping by and listening to another episode of project recovery and in case you forgot project recovery is what it's a ksl podcast he's Casey. a musician too i know i feel humbled <laughs> me too
contents of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.